Michael Brooks. I represent Father Aaron Deacons. Mr. Deacons, would you identify yourself, please? Aaron Deacons, I'm the father. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have you on mute just because there's a lot of uh, noise coming from where you are there this morning. Um, but if you need anything, just uh, raise your hand and we will give you an opportunity to speak today if you so choose to speak. Okay, go ahead. Lee Heist, lawyer guardian ad litem. Nastasia Thomas, counsel for the department. Chelsea Grant with the department. Thank you so much. All right. Um, anything preliminary before we begin today's proceedings on the adjudication trial? I am assuming that uh, Mrs. Deacons is being having her trial separately. She has already entered a plea, and her initial disposition is scheduled for this afternoon. Oh, I see. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other preliminaries? No. No. Right. Openings. no. I'll leave that opening. All right. Your first witness, Ms. Thomas. Thank you, and I will call Mr. Deacons. I'd like to start by objecting to the format of this petition. You know what it's about. Five, six pages long, single space, subparagraphs. We could be here a month with this if we were so inclined. Do not, know that? Not necessary. Well, uh, I get I notice as far as anything she might want to ask about, though. Okay. Okay. Uh, whenever you're ready, Ms. Thomas. Um, Mr. Deacons, I am the attorney for the department. And so I'm just going to ask you a few questions about what is alleged in the petition. And the only thing I care about is the truth. So if I said something wrong or anything like that, please feel free to correct me when I'm done speaking. Because you're on Polycom, it gets a little hard. So if you can just wait until I'm done asking the question for you to answer, that'd be really appreciated by myself and by the reporter, okay? Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Deacons, how many children, do you have any children? Yes, I have three. And how, um, we are alive. So I'm just gonna ask the approximate ages of your children. I have 14, 13, and a six-year-old. And are all three children with the, do they have the same mother? Yes. And are you married to their mother? Yes. And have your children ever been removed from your care in the past? Yes, they have. And what was the reason they were removed for? They were, uh, we had a CPS case and then uh, Lilith had gotten marks from her mother. And so it, um, what would you say the reasoning is, was, was that physical discipline or domestic violence? Can you just elaborate on that a little more? That was from physical discipline. Do you remember any of the services? Well, let me ask mm -hmm. first about how long ago was that removal? 11 years ago. So about 2013, 2014 time? Yes. Okay. And do you recall any services you might have participated in during that removal? Uh, nurturing fathers program, uh, domestic violence program. Uh, personal therapy. Do you feel like you benefited? I'm sorry. Was there anything else you wanted to add? Okay. Do you feel like you benefited from those services at that time? Yes, I did. And other than that removal, was there any other involvement with CPS between 2013-14 to present day? Uh, we had PPS all a few times prior to that, I believe. Prior to the removal? Or after it, yeah. Okay, after the removal. Do you recall what the why they were called? I don't. I don't recall fully. No. 
would you say CPS became involved in this most recent um, process? Uh, in October. Okay. And what was the reason CPS was called in October? Because Connor stated that I abused him to a therapist. And at that time, um, what were you aware of that Connor stated the physical abuse was? Like, uh, I don't know. I wasn't there in the meeting. Okay. And when CPS came and talked with you, did they just um, discuss with you what the allegations were or what the complaint stated? That I was slapping Connor in the face, arms in various parts of the body. And do you physically discipline your children? Yes, I do use corporal punishment. And is it your testimony that you have or you did slap Connor's face, arm, or other body parts? Um, I would use, I would spank him, yes. And I'd smack him in the mouth when he would toss her back and forth. And during the Nurturing Fathers program, I know that was a long, long time ago, but did that program discuss other ways to discipline children? Yes, it did. What are some of the other ways you remember that program um, addressing how to discipline children, other than corporal punishment? Uh, standing in a corner or taking away light items. And did you ever try those things with your children? Yes, I have. And is there, what is the reason you resort to back to the physical discipline? I really couldn't tell you honestly. Um, in the petition, there's an allegation that you had pulled one of your daughters out of a vehicle by her neck or arm or some other body part. Can you tell us a little more about that allegation or if that happened? Um, <clears throat> I removed her from a car and it was not by her neck or arms. It was all within under her arm area. And she didn't fall out of the car when I removed her. I picked her up and carried her out of the car. How old is that child? She was 12 at the time. And does that child have any special needs? She does not. No diagnosis of like autism or ADHD or anything like that? She does not. Um, in the last, I don't know, let's say four or five months, so since, I, since uh, CPS has been involved or about October, has there been any contact with law enforcement because of physical discipline in your home or domestic violence? Yes, my 12-year-old 12, 12 time daughter uh, called the cops on me for smacking her in the mouth, for back-mouthing her mother and I. And were there any other incidents where law enforcement was called to the home? Yes, there were more, multiple times, but not for physical discipline. So in the petition alleges on 10-7-23 that there was um, a call for possible domestic violence between Aaron and Stormy, and that's the incident you just discussed, correct? Yes. Okay. And then on 10-31, um, it looks like there was another interaction with law enforcement regarding um that earlier October incident and there maybe were some interviews during that interaction. Do you recall that? What was it? 
At the end of October, do you recall law enforcement coming back to interview you and the family regarding physical discipline of your children? Uh, yes, I had a detective ask me about physical discipline. And I just am curious, did you receive any, I don't know, advice or permission to use physical discipline on your children from anyone? Um, I was told that legally in the state of Michigan, it is legal to use physical discipline with an open hand as long as you don't leave marks. And do your children typically respond positively to the physical discipline? Does it make them do what you've asked them to do? It does. Okay. Um, do you recall the law enforcement being called to the home on or about November 11th regarding possible domestic violence, um, allegations that you slashed a tire or broke a car window? That wasn't on any domestic violence. And there was no there was no broken window, there was no slash tire, and there was no gun nor knife involved. Can you tell me a little more so about they, that incident though? Like what happened? Why they were called? That was me and my wife having a argument and I smacked the window and walked away as the Stormy called the cops. Do you and I sat in the driveway. I sat in the driveway while the officers showed up. There was no gun, no knife, no slash tire, no broken window. And do you and your wife uh, typically argue? Like, how do you describe you and your wife's relationship? Lately, it's been rough. Tell me a little more about that. I don't know what to tell you. It's personal. Uh, so I'm, I'm more curious about what it means uh, when you say rough. And I think we might all have our own definitions of what a rough relationship is. So in your own words, can you explain that to, to us, please? Um, I've caught my wife talking to other men and sending naked photos to other men. And how did that make you feel? I mean, how would it make you feel? Are you upset? And when you were pretty upset, how did you react? What was your response to finding that out? I'd start arguing with her. And are the children typically home when there are arguments in between you and your wife? The past couple times they have been, yes. And during these arguments, have you been physically aggressive with her at all? I have not. Do you recall an incident when law enforcement was called on or about um, December 22nd? <laughs> Um, I do recall it. Uh, it's a domestic violence case that's still ongoing. Can you tell us a little more about what happened at that incident? Um, I grabbed her phone off of the bathroom sink and was showing her her phone because she logged out of Snapchat from where she had sent nudes to another man. While she was in the shower and she was grabbing for her phone, I refused to give her her phone, so she started screaming for Stormy to call the cops. Was there any physical contact between the two of you during that incident? No, there was not. As soon as she started screaming, I exited the bathroom and I have video proof. Um. There's a, a police report, and I, we had requested this be in person so we could present this to you, um, but it's a little hard being on polycom. But there's a police report that indicates there was maybe a scratch on her finger or some redness maybe by her uh, clavicle, her collarbone.
from grabbing? Do you, was that an accurate reflection of what happened that day? I was half naked. I chewed my fingernails. How would I scratch? There was nothing I, I could scratch her with. Okay. And so at no point did your wife like have the phone and you reached over her body to grab it or anything? No. Case is still ongoing. What do you what do you mean by that? Is there still like an investigation? Was like what happened, I guess, afterwards? I'm still going to court over it. Did, is, did, uh, did it result in like a PPO being filed against you? Uh, it resulted in a no contact order. And uh, did you comply with the conditions of the no contact order? When I got out of jail, she called me and wanted me to come back to the house, so I did. And once she went back to the house um, at her request, were there was there another incident with law enforcement? I was idle, so she had her mom call in a welfare check on me. And I was arrested again and taken to um, Bixby Hospital for uh, medical attention. And did you complete or do like a voluntary inpatient treatment for mental health? Yes, I did. And um, what do you believe you needed that mental health treatment for? What, were, what mental health symptoms or illnesses um, were you experiencing at that time? You know, you stated suicide patients. Was there anything else? No. Do you recall um, stating to the physician that sometimes your anger, it's too much and it gets in the way? Yes. And do you recall um, disclosing that your depression was really severe and that you had lost your job because you were unable to wake up on time? No, I lost my job because of my depression and falling asleep at work. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and in your inpatient treatment for substance abuse or use ever um, discussed and how that might be influencing your mental health? What was that? Um, during your inpatient treatment, did substance use or abuse ever get discussed and how that might be impacting your mental health? That wasn't discussed. Did you disclose um, occasional or regular use of methamphetamines or amphetamines? I don't have regular use of it. Can you tell us a little more about the use of um, amphetamines or methamphetamines? I have tried it. Did you try it just once or has that been an occasional thing? I've tried it once. And um, do you ever have like auditorial or visual hallucinations hearing or seeing things that might not be there to other people? I do. And prior to receiving inpatient treatment, were you able to receive mental health treatment from community sources like um, Adrian Counseling and Psychiatry or Community Mental Health or any other place? I've been receiving help through CMH. And is that mostly for medications, medication review or something else? Um, I got put on medication and I got therapy. How often are you engaged in therapy? Uh, once a week right now. And in therapy, are you able to discuss anger management, depression, um, family life? Are those things that you're able to discuss during therapy? Yeah. 
generally, do you struggle to manage your anger? Without medication, yes. Since October, have you been on medication now? Since October, no. Is there a reason you weren't on medication since October? Because I didn't think that I needed medication for help. Okay. If this court finds that there's been a violation of the juvenile code, so the, the law that governs how children um, are to be treated, and the court decides to take jurisdiction over you, um, the court would order you into something called a case service plan at a hearing called the initial dispositional hearing. Um, and in that plan, it would outline what needs to be done to safely get you and your family back together, which I think you're probably familiar with from your prior case. In your opinion, uh, what services do you think you would need if that happens? Like what services would you like to engage in or think you could benefit from? I'm already starting to try and enroll myself into services for uh, another fathering case. <clears throat> uh, I'm looking for local domestic violence, but I don't think there's anything locally anymore. Um, but uh, along with doing my therapy and maintaining that I take my medications. Um, I, this is maybe an odd question for me to ask at this point, but what is your goal with your relationship with your wife? Do you want to remain in that relationship or um, have you guys discussed what the future looks like for the two of you? I haven't gotten to discuss anything with her. And today, I know that you're incarcerated. Can you tell us a little more about what happened that led to your incarceration? Because I violated the no contact order and went to um, the site, the mental hospital. Um, they issued a warrant and I turned myself in. Okay, thank you. And uh, when prior to your incarceration or ever sh short term that might be, where are you currently living? I don't need an address, just generally where are you living? I was staying with my aunt Jen. And is that someplace you might be able to reside longer term or no? I can't consider it at home, if that's what you're asking, but I can stay there. Okay. And I, I know that we discussed um, termination of your of employment at, at some point in time in October. Have you been able to secure employment since then? No, I was working uh, under the table jobs, and, but not right now. Do you have any idea how long you'll remain incarcerated for? Since yesterday. But have you had any hearing to indicate how long that might be or a bond is or anything like that? Have you had any arraignment? Well, my bond is 5,000 gas surety and then um, they denied my, they denied a PR bond because of reasons. Okay. Um, Mr. Dickens, this might be a, a harder question, but do you believe that your children are safe in your care, emotionally and physically? Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have no further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Brooks. I uh, am listening. You and I have talked before in my office. And I, I, again today, I've heard a lot of the same sim, similar things. What interests me is this pattern of your wife or your children immediately calling the police to tell on you, I guess I'd say. Am I wrong that there's a pattern like that? 
No, it happens frequently when my wife doesn't seem to get her way. She seems to make odd allegations like, uh, for instance, that I was sleeping with a CPS worker, Megan McVeigh. Uh, that was an allegation made so that she could try and get her way. Is that a common trait that she uses in arguments? It is. And you've been married how long? Say, uh, seven years. Okay. The children, two of the children are older than that. Uh, they are your children, though, right? Yes, they are. All right. We've been together uh, for 16 years. Okay, married for seven. I understand. Now, you also mentioned a an incident where the police came to your house, something about a broken car window, I, at least that's the impression I get, slashed tires and a knife. Would you tell me what that's supposed to be about? Uh, the police report states that uh, they were dispatched to the home for uh, me threatening my child and wife with a knife and a gun with, and that there was supposedly a broken window and a slash car tire but upon arrival there was no broken window and no slash tire and they did not find a knife nor a gun well let's ask the obvious question was there a knife or a gun used in the incident i would never use inappropriately use a gun nor a knife especially towards my own family is the answer no no Is that the first time your wife or your children have exaggerated circumstances involving these problems? It is not. Just over the summer, my wife filed for divorce and claimed that I raped her just because I wouldn't let her stay in the house. Because you wouldn't let what? Because I wouldn't allow her to stay in the house. And then she removed the she removed the allegations later on. Is there a divorce pending? Uh, that was that was stopped because she decided that she wanted to be with me in October. And then for my knowledge from what I've heard, there's a divorce now, but I haven't been served. Have there ever been any documented injuries to your children as a result of your physical discipline? No. Has your wife alleged significant injuries to your children as a result? I'm not saying they happened, but has she alleged physical injuries that she claims were inflicted by you on your kids? Not that I know of, no. Where did the information come from if you know that you are excessively violent with your children? Where did the information come from if you know that you are excessively violent with your children? I don't know. Uh, I know that Connor made a statement and that's much all I know on that. Um, I know that Stormy's claim that I get aggressive. How old is she? 13. To your knowledge, has there been any reports from the schools that they've observed injuries to your children? There are not. Where do they go to school? What medications are you currently taking? Um, there's a, a big list of them now. I can't 
give you all of them yet. I just started on them with uh, the beginning of this month, but uh, I know I'm on Tripol and I'm on Beast Bar for my anxiety. Uh, yeah, there's a list of medications that I'm on for uh, mood stabilizers and anxiety and depression. Now, you and I, I think, last, talked in my office last week, right? Yes. Now, your affect is a lot more muted today than it was in my office, isn't it? Yes. Is that because of the medications you're taking? It is. If I can summarize what you claim are your responses to these allegations that have you in all this trouble, would you agree or disagree with me that the allegations are, quote, and this is my words, exaggerated? Yes. You think you're a good dad, bad dad, something in between? I'm not a perfect dad, but I do believe I'm a good dad. What kind of a husband are you? I don't believe I'm a good husband. You believe you are or you're not? I don't believe I am. I If I can't keep the interest of my wife, but... Okay. Since you've been in jail, which I guess is just 48 hours or thereabouts, right? Yeah. Has your wife attempted to contact you? She has not. When's the last time you contacted her or she contacted you? Um, she attempted to contact me uh, the morning I showed up at your office via um FaceTime and I did not answer. Now over the years, whether you were married or just living together or whatever, have there been other incidents where the powers that be have it said you can't get in touch with your wife for whatever reason? Yes. And when that's occurred, Acknowledge that some of those times it is you who violated it, right? Yes. And would it be fair to say other times it is your wife who's violated it? Yes. In other words, both of you tend to ignore, have tended in the past <clears throat> to ignore it. Is that right? Yes. Is there anything else you want the court to know here this morning? No, there's not. You feel you should be in the Illinois County Jail? No, I don't. You feel you're an abusive father? No. I don't feel that I am a safety risk for my children or my wife. I, this isn't the first time I've sat in jail wondering why I'm sitting here. But. Is it because your wife or your kids call the cops on you? Because my wife Yes. Okay. Is there anything else you want the court to know? No. All right. Thank you, sir. That's all the questions I have, Your Honor. Ms. Hikes, I have no questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, your next witness, Ms. Uh, Thomas. Uh, I will call Ms. Grant. Okay, Ms. Chelsea Grant, come on up to our witness stand. Ms. Grant, you can you just briefly state your role in this matter? 
Um, I am the ongoing worker for the family through the department. And can you elaborate a little more about what it means to be the ongoing worker for the family? Sure, so that means an investigation was um, conducted to find if there are abuse or neglect happening within the family. Um, when a abuse or neglect is substantiated or confirmed within an investigation, it transfers to an ongoing worker, um, where we try to help the family with services, reduce the risk, put in barriers for the safety of the children in place um, to kind of prevent it moving forward to where we're at now in court intervention. Um, so it's kind of the step in between those two. How long have you been the ongoing worker for this family? Um, in November. And when you get a case as an ongoing worker, what procedures or what is the process that you um, take to know, learn about the family? Sure, so we have um, what's called transfer meetings with the investigators to kind of learn like what the current investigation is confirmed for, what the issues are, those kind of things. We review the past case history. Um, we conduct family team meetings with the family we, and safety plan from there. Um, and then part of my ongoing is meeting with the family, um, evaluating services, creating safety plans, um, and trying to help the family reduce the risk of harm to the children. And the children. Okay. When you had that transfer meeting, what was, um, what did you perceive to be the risk of harm to the children in this case? Um, I believe when it was transferred to me, the risk was intensive um, through the risk assessments. Um, the it was higher intensive. Um, the ongoing issues within the family are um, domestic violence that was transferred and informed to me that there was um, mental health issues and um, for everyone involved in the family and also um, continued inappropriate discipline. I know you're not law enforcement or a lawyer, but is it, to the best of your knowledge, is it legal for parents to use corporal punishment as a form of discipline for their children? So it we struggle with that quite often. It, it is not illegal unless there's a star marker bruise for law enforcement to press charges against. Um, it is it is borderline because you know you start dealing with the mental um, stuff with the kid where you know we can't necessarily diagnose that right away. But when a child's telling you that constantly they're afraid of their parent or doing something wrong because they're afraid they're going to be hit or slapped or punched, it's very borderline. You signed this petition before the court today, correct? That's correct. You are not the ongoing or the primary investigator, I suppose the best way to describe that. Is that correct? That's correct. There's been two investigations, one that originally opened the case, um, and that would be Mr. Trout. And then when the domestic violence came in, um, there was another investigator, Ms. Salinas, that was um, assigned to that as well. However, she and I, because I was already involved with the family, did work together, work together, work together quite often. As an ongoing worker, um, you state that you meet with the family, kind of identify areas of need, plan for services, um, and the like. And in this case, did you have the opportunity to meet with the three children and both parents separately or together? Just have you had contact with all the family yes. members? Yes. At various times. Um, Mr. Deacon's position is that the petition itself is overly exaggerated, the allegations. Um, can you respond to that a little more about how the information, how you obtain the information in the petition and uh, whether you checked those allegations for the truthfulness or to the best of your ability and whether you believe they're exaggerated? Well, I disagree that they're exaggerated. Um, so I'm not sure if you want me to start at the beginning of like the initial investigation being opened. Um, Ms. Trout conducted that investigation. Obviously, I reviewed it. Um, there were several police reports of the family coming to the home um, through Ms. Trout's investigation. Mom even discusses the ongoing domestic violence between the family when she was originally conducting the investigation in itself. Um, Mom had actually originally filed for divorce for uh, back in April, but in all that divorce in October, stating that she had nowhere else to go. So she went back home to Aaron and thought that he had changed and worked on his mental health issues. Um, and however, she was still skeptical. The house was being reported by camera. She had her things still in totes when Ms. Strout was investigating. Um, so, you know, there was still that concern of ongoing domestic violence that if she needed to leave the home, she could. Um, there were the concerns of the inappropriate discipline with Connor and Stormy, including the incident with Stormy where, um, Myself and Ms. Trapp had viewed the video in which he did drag her out of the car. Um, she 
I believe she did hit the ground, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, I don't think she bumped her head, but um, I would have to review, but I'm, I'm pretty sure she hit her head, but he was literally dragging her out of the car and she was holding the bar um, in the car. Um, so there was that. Um, I object to the way the incident is being characterized unless this client or this witness has firsthand information or some reliable information that is the equivalent of firsthand information, which I know she doesn't have. Uh, Your Honor, my question was about her opinion as to whether the allegations are exaggerated and what process she used to confirm the veracity of the allegations contained in the petition. Um, I don't believe that so it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, but for the purposes for which she included, or um, for her drafting purposes, I suppose. The incident being described took place not recently, but several years ago, at least a couple of years ago. It was videotaped, and I would love to get into that if we ever get a chance as to what happened to the videotape. But the videotape's gone. This witness was not there nor anybody else in this room was there. And the information is not admissible because it's not reliably accurate. Your Honor, I think she said she viewed the video. Yeah, well, let me see it. Well, that's a different objection than she doesn't have firsthand knowledge. She's telling us what she saw in the video. I think that uh, obviously the video would be the best evidence under the circumstances and I do you agree with Mr. Brooks that <clears throat> I think this is being offered for the truth of the matter asserted and that we would need uh, access to that video in order to properly um, allow for admission as well as <clears throat> the incident itself. So for those reasons, I'm going to uh, uphold the objection and I will disregard that particular piece of testimony. Your next question. Thank you. Um, so outside of the sure. video. Um, did you just, did you have the opportunity to speak with the children? Yes. So, um, during our family team meeting, we spoke with the children, um, with their mom there prior to Aaron coming into the room, um, with the investigator that had opened the case, um, during that family team meeting, um, uh, mom was still very adamant that she no longer wanted to be in this relationship. She wanted to leave. There, there was domestic violence. However, she was afraid of Aaron. Um, each child, um, the oldest LD doesn't really, um, she doesn't really talk much. She will not say much, disclose much, those sorts of things. Um, SD is very vocal in her feelings and thoughts towards dad, towards dad and mom's relationship. Um, she is very vocal about the concerns she has with dad being violent, not only with mom, but also with her and her siblings. And CD is also very, vocal about how um, dad is physically um, physical with him through punishment. Um, and then during that family team meeting, we had um, discussions with mom and dad regarding services, what services they were in, the children's services, um, those kind of things moving forward um, and trying to plan. Um, the family team meeting was difficult to plan because we have Chanel beforehand stating that she no longer wants to be in this relationship or do anything. However, during the actual meeting, she is not confident to voice that or say those things in front of Aaron. Um, and instead, almost just agrees with him and saying like, yep, we'll be together, we'll do these things. Um, so it's very difficult when it comes to definitely a domestic violence situation. Um, and also assuming that she's safe knowing the history of domestic violence. Um, but moving forward, there were other incidents where she failed to protect her children. Okay. And I just want to clarify, today's trial is not about mom. Correct. Um, it's My question is more about why you believe that there was a risk of harm to the children to the extent that a petition for removal from both parents needed to be filed. Sure. And um, so you're giving the information about the family comedians and things yes. that have been said. Mr. Deacon, uh, Deacon's position is also that uh, mom has generally or sometimes makes things up and is not necessarily truthful if things are bad and it's sort of maybe um, these are my own words but maybe an abuse of process where she you knows she can call cops and there'll be a response or CPS will come out. Um, were you able to verify any of these incidents? Like was she lying or is she lying? So 
there are several incidents there's several police reports in which like police were called to the home um they responded they don't always find dad um make any arrests or anything at that date and time um however when you follow up like for instance, there was the domestic that happened between Aaron and Chanel, in which he is currently being charged through a district court that occurred. Um, obviously, their version of stories are very, very different. Um, when you speak with the children, um, they talk about how they heard the argument. They heard the physical between the two of them. Um, it was SC who actually called for mom because she had stated they were being physical. Um, Mom doesn't always call and report on dad, even when um, she really should. Um, for example, um, when he violated, you know, he was very honest and he's, or at least the most that I can know is that he's like, well, she invited me over, which she denies. Um, but they were in the home together. And when mom was confronted to ask, like, did you call law enforcement? Did you, you know, call for help with friends? Did you do those things? She did not. Um, but Aaron also, in having a conversation with him, openly knew he was not supposed to be there. He openly knew that he should be staying at somewhere else. He had told CPI, myself and the investigator that he was staying at a relative's house where when I went and checked that out, that was not the case. Um, even the relative said like, no, he's at home. He's with Chanel. Um, we got that from several relatives and we also ended up following that up with um, the children who also stated that yep, dad was home all weekend to the point that they could tell us what movie they watched and what they ate for dinner and um, who was all at the house when they watched the movie that weekend. Um, even now we're still getting people calling us saying that like dad and mom are together or they're at the house or they're still talking, um, even with the children removed. And in your opinion, what I guess, what, what was the risk of harm to the children that you determined through the department processes that was necessary to file a petition? So this is a repeated pattern <laughs> for mom and dad when it comes to domestic violence issues, physical discipline. Um, mom has had the opportunity to leave the relationship several times and has not. Um, all of these children have diagnosis. All of these children have ment um, mental health needs that are not fully being addressed in it or at sorry, lost word, adequately um, addressed within the family, which falls on both parents. Um, every time they're arguing or they're fighting, it is getting the children agitated where they do call police. Um, the children um, have stated several times that they don't believe their parents should be together because of how volatile and back and forth it is. Um, it, but at the same time to them, when they're in that actual environment, it's almost normal to them that they're unaffected when the actual fight is going on. Yeah. We've, kind of, we've kind of talked a little bit about police reports and you have those present today, but aren't able to get those in um, the way we need to. I, did you have an opportunity to review those? I have. And you also heard Mr. Deacon testify, correct? Correct. And Mr. Deacon testified pretty accurately, correct? In his defense, he, everything he said was pretty accurate. I wouldn't say all of it was accurate okay. for the police reports. Okay. Do um, you recall what police report? would have reflected something different than Mr. Deacon said? I don't know the actual number, um, but the one where the police were called due to the threatening mom with a knife and a gun, um, while when police had arrived, while he didn't have um, a gun or anything on him, he did have a pocket knife that they held on to. Um, the tires of the car were deflated when police arrived, and they couldn't find the slash marks on the tires, but the tires were deflated. Um, Chanel had stated in the police report that he, um, they were not like that early in the day and that the back windshield, um, was punched by Aaron and that's how it was broken. And I've also observed that truck with the broken windshield. So I do know that, or not windshield, I'm sorry, the back window of the truck. So I do know that is also broken. Um, there was also, uh, through the police report of, him violating the no contact order. Um, he was pretty accurate when he, even when he told us that he was invited to Ch by Chanel to come back to the home. Um, and that's where he went, even though he had a no contact order. Um, he stayed at the home the entire week. Um, the children for a time were at her mother's home 
in a safety plan um, just to give her the week to kind of relax and um, she was working so she had ample opportunity if he was at the home to seek help um, he it was actually one of the children that reached out to maternal grandmother to let them know that Aaron was in the home and she started asking Chanel and Chanel eventually said yes he's in the home so she called police um, when police arrived Aaron had stated that he was going to hang himself. However, what he told me and the investigator is different when I asked him what his plan was. Because I don't, um, he stated that he was going himself in the head with a gun. During your work with the family, have the children expressed knowledge of like the mental health concerns or the suicidal ideations or being afraid there's firearms in the home or anything like that? Yeah, so like I said, all the kids have mental health diagnosis. Um, I even have a video that was sent to me from um, SD's personal TikTok in which she um, talks about how she, her biggest fear in life is ending up like her dad because they have very similar diagnosis. Um, ODD, mood disorder, there's concern she might even have schizophrenia like dad. Um, and she's very vocal in the sense that she doesn't want to be angry. She doesn't want to be like that. She doesn't want to have that behavior. Some of the, one of, one of the reasons the petition so long is because we the, it's on the department to prove that reasonable efforts to prevent removal are also being done. Correct. And you've testified to several of them. Are there any other reasonable efforts that have been put forth to prevent this petition from being filed? Yeah, so some of those um, also include the family has had, you know, are in services. Um, there is mom even went and filed, you know, a personal protection order for her and the children. And while it wasn't granted um, fully for a protection order for the children as well, um, you know, she made those steps, but then continued to violate um, even a protection order she put in place. She filed for divorce, but continued to violate that. Um, and he, he violated the protection order too, going to the home, knowing he wasn't supposed to be there. Um, following even being served with the actual protection order, I believe is in the police report just before he goes to, um, Hillsdale Hospital still knowingly can't be at that home and there's several reports that he's at that home there's a service provider that viewed him in the backyard um it goes on uh your honor I have no further questions of Ms. Grant at this time cross-examination both parents have violated the various and sundry prohibitions against contact with the other, haven't they? Correct. Now, with respect to these children, has there been any documented evidence of injuries to these kids? What do you mean in injuries? What do you mean by an injury? It's your petition. If you're meaning by red marks and those type of things, yes. Service providers have viewed it. There's been pictures sent to us. The kids state that these things are happening. They have the emotional distress in police reports where it's stating that when the incident's happening and there's domestic violence happening, the kids are agitated. Um, the kids voice these concerns to their therapists when they do see them. Um, however, going to therapists is not consistent. They ever been to a hospital for their treatment of injuries? Uh, SD was in Havenwick in September for self harm. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. Thank you for that. But injuries inflicted by an abusive father. Well, I guess that again comes if you're talking about physical injuries, maybe not necessarily if you're talking about emotional turmoil, possibly. Well, one of the things we're talking about here, though, is this man sitting here in jail is a physically abusive father, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And he admitted to using corporal punishment on his children. Yes. And if I recall, your opinion about corporal punishment is you are, quote unquote, borderline on that, right? 
I was asked if it is against the law. It is against the law if there's a scar marker bruise left or a red mark. Well, that doesn't always ask, mean that criminal charges will be filed. Uh, then let me ask you a more personal question. Are you opposed to corporal punishment? I am. Totally. Yes. I do not believe that hitting a child will get you the results that you were asking for. Do you have kids? I do. You also mentioned that my client is in jail at the moment for a domestic violence charge. That, that's not accurate, is it? It is. He has a domestic violence charge with a warrant that was made because he violated his bond conditions. Which is what put him in jail. It's still listed under the domestic violence charge. How much responsibility would you place at the feet of the mother in this thing? I think they're both responsible. They're both 50-50 responsible or 100-100, depending on how you look at it. Okay. Is she, in your opinion, physically violent with her children? She does at times use inappropriate discipline. Um, my understanding, um, in the past, she has you know, smacked, hit, those kind of things. Um, children are not reporting her continuing to use that at this time, um, that it's mostly dad. Would your disapproval be the same for her in terms right. of corporate or corporal punishment? Yes, based on, yeah. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Uh, no, uh, no, no questions, thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mayor Jefferson. Thank you. Any other witnesses, Ms. Thomas? Um, Your Honor, I do intend to call um, Ms. Deacons, uh, we have, I guess this is a few things, but she, her attorney is not available until three, our three o'clock dispositional hearing. Um, and I know that we have another hearing scheduled at 1130. And at this time, I was um, going to ask the court if they would entertain a recess until the three o'clock hearing to allow for that testimony. Well, I hadn't anticipated this, but I'll probably be here on Zoom. If that's all right. Yes. Ms. Hanks? Um, I have no objection to continuing this till the disposition that we already had scheduled at three. Very well. Um, okay. So we will uh, make sure that we let the jail know as well independently, uh, but we're going to adjourn uh, at this time and reconvene at three o'clock this afternoon uh, for the rest of your uh, trial, Mr. D. Hanks. Thank you for your patience and for your testimony this morning. To conclude the trial as it relates to Mr. Aaron Deacons, but we don't have him back yet to the jail. So we also had scheduled today the initial disposition as it relates to Chanel Deacon. So we'll be uh, tackling the initial disposition as it relates to Ms. Chanel Deacon <clears throat> as we await the return of Mr. Aaron Deacons. Appearances, please. Lee Heiss, lawyer, guardian, and litem. Nastasia Thomas, counsel for the department. And just some direct foster care workers from Foster Solutions. Good afternoon, Ariel Berger here on behalf of Chanel Deacons. Good day, Chanel Deacons. All right, Ms. Heiss. Thank you, Your Honor. On January 16th, I got all the placement information that I needed, and I didn't visit these kids. And I don't know why, because I marked that I did. I think um, I visited some other kids that I thought were these kids. So I really look forward to meeting with them. And um, I have their placement information so that I can do that, but I don't have a report to give today. Other than the investigation into other things that you can see, the uh, I have received and reviewed the court report and the proposed case service plan. I also have uh, some Native American heritage documentation, and I'm not sure if that was separated from the initial petition, Ms. Thomas, because uh, the initial petition does appear to reference some uh, inquiries into Native American heritage. Uh, but so I would like to know if that's something that was separated at the clerk's office level or if it was applied after, if you know. I'm going to review my notes. Um, Your Honor, apparently it was submitted together. Um, I know that the received petition that I have on my end doesn't have the ICWA documentation on there, but um, I believe that there was testimony at the prelim about that. All right, Deputy Anson, you can uh, pass this over to Ms. Thomas and ask her to let me know if this is what was attached to the initial petition. Or if there's anything else that's missing, I'll take it up with the clerk's office to find out why they are taking part in meetings. Oh, Deputy Ames, could you ask Mr. Powell to contact the jail and find out if Mr. Deacons will be available to us in the subway? I will. Thank you.
Thank you, Mayor. My office had submitted this position um, via email on Wednesday, January 10th at 2.21 p.m. We put on that were three attachments, which were the initial petition for removal, the ICWA documentation, and then a notice of hearing that was drafted by us, um, given uh, with the proposal date that was provided by our office. So I, it was submitted at that time. Um, I'm not sure. There's anything else you need from me on that point. Well, can you have a look at what I handed you and let me know if that's the same thing that was supposed to be attached to the petition in my file? And I'm sorry for this. I, I will address this with, with the clerk's office. It looks like it's just printed off in a different order. I mean, perhaps it just because it makes more sense the way that the clerks have printed it on. Um, I uh, oh yes, yeah. so then, then yes, that's probably why it's here. Right but yes, this is the information. Um, it's a total of thirty pages. Thank you so much, Jeff James. Would you mind handing me that back yeah, before you go? Sure. Thank you. All right. So I will receive that then uh, officially for purposes of today as well, and take that issue off with the clerks. Testimony today, um, Your Honor. At this time, I don't want to waste the court's resources, but I would just ask for a quick sidebar. All right. Well, as it relates to mom's disposition, counselors, I'll let you uh, address what was uh, discussed at sidebar. Uh, thank you, Honor. There, um, there was just some concern about ensuring we're complying with the statute and no um, I guess issues moving forward for appellate purposes or otherwise. Um, so at this point, we're going to, um, I believe we're all in agreement for an adjournment for the initial disposition until February 8th to permit the LJL to speak with the children. Um, and that way she has a better um idea of their needs, their desires, and we can um, ensure that that is adequately addressed at the dispositional hearing. Ms. Berger? Yes, Your Honor, I do believe that that accurately reflects um, our discussions um, in our sidebar. Um, I do generally object to proceeding um, when that standard has not been met, so I am in agreement um, with continuing to the 8th. Very good. I think you also um, expressed some concern that your client maybe needed a little more time with the court report. Yes, um, I've been able to speak with her a little bit more since our last hearing, and we are requesting um, additional time uh, with the caseworkers to review that. Um, it has been disclosed that she does have a learning disability, so I think that in order to comply with all regulations, um, we need to make sure that she does um, fully understand that. So uh, would you be able to meet with her? Uh, Ms. Madrid, between now and when we come back to go over that? Yes, we actually have a team scheduled um, in the team, so that will be the conversation. Okay, so uh, what's being asked of us, uh, Ms. Chanel uh, Deakins, is to move today's hearing to February 8th so that Ms. Heiss can talk with the children and you can have a little more time with the court report. It's just... All right. Okay, I think those are good reasons to allow for the adjournment. Uh, if there's anything uh, else that needs to be addressed in the interim, please make sure you bring it up uh, with your attorney and with Ms. Madrid. Uh, family team well, is a great place to do that. Why my attorney is right here, because I did bring this up with her prior. Um, my parenting time. How is that supposed to be? So, uh, Ms. Berger, do you want to uh, elicit a testimony from your client on this point or address this at all between now and when we come back? Leave it at an FDM. What do you want to tackle? I probably will. Um, if we're going to continue with dad's portion, I probably will just ask the caseworker to explain it. All right. Why don't we Why don't we tackle that now? Okay, Ms. Madrid, what's going on with parenting time? Um, so, Ms. Eakins is visiting um, Mondays. Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. <clears throat> um, right now we have a draft time frame of 6.15 to 8.15, which is her availability after work. Um, but she's able to stay there longer or she's able to add in times as long as it's agreeable with the caregiver. So she's able to come and uh, visit during those days, stay longer, do bedtime. Um, so she does have liberal parenting time as far as, as long as it's agreeable with the caregiver. Okay. Uh, questions, Ms. Berger? Thank you. Um, Ms. Madrid, can you explain a little bit more why maternal grandmother is no longer an approved supervisor? Yes. So it's my understanding that at the time of placement, um, there was some kind of situation that occurred where she was not appropriate in front of the children. Um, and so during a transfer meeting with CPS and foster care, it was <clears throat> agreed that 
as of right now, she, she would not be appropriate due to concerns <clears throat> of behavior that she had in front of the children during placement, as well as concerns of her not being able to intervene if mom is inappropriate ha or having inappropriate behaviors around the kids. And um, were any of the things that were said by grandmother, were those said in front of the children? Um, it is my understanding that they were present, yes. Okay. And um, is parenting time at the agency at all, or is it all at placements home? So for three out of the four days, it is at the caregiver's home. And then one, at, one of the days it's at the agency so that we can have an opportunity to view their interactions and report on that to the court. And who's supervising those at the agency? Um, that is between me and the visit staff at the agency. And are those visits not able to be supervised or observed at um, the relative placement home? Um, I can explore that if the relative is in agreement with allowing that, yes. Okay, and um, they don't have to be in agreement for parenting time. Are you aware of that? If it's in their home, it's my understanding that yes. The judge can order that, is that correct? Um, it's my understanding that if it's in their home, they have to agree to it. Okay. I have another question, Judge. Thank you. Ms. Heiss? I have no questions. Thank you. Very good. Uh, does, this, does that answer your question? Um, or do you, I mean, you might even take some time to talk to Ms. Berger about this uh, privately, it sounds like. Uh, Ms. Berger, did you have anyone else you wanted us to hear from or any other argument that you wanted to make on the issue of parent time pending the resumption of our proceedings? I'm just going to have get it because it's hard for I love the, the other other kids that are at the placement home I love them they're my nieces it's just when I'm trying to spend time with my kids it's hard to so I like the opportunity that if my mom could be reestablished as a supervisor for her and I to be able to pick my kids up go to my grandmother's house and have my visits well, at this point in time, uh, or that's not something that's approved by the department. So that would be something you'd have to work with them about and work with Ms. Heiss about. I mean, if there's not an incident, then you are gonna have to work through that. And a family team meeting is probably the best place to do that, honestly. So I would uh, recommend that you contact Ms. Berger uh, after today's hearing to talk through uh, that strategy. All right. I'm not going to make any changes to parenting time at this point. Uh, it sounds like it can't. There is some tweaking that could be done to potentially make it more optimal, uh, but it certainly is uh, satisfactory uh, at this point. Uh, although I do encourage Ms. Madrid, and she knows that uh, I always encourage additional parenting time as much as possible. So I can trust her to continue to work on that. And Ms. Berger is an excellent advocate. She'll be definitely working uh, to increase that as much as we can safely, as will Ms. Heiss. So uh, for now, all prior orders will remain in full force in effect, and we'll take your case back up on February 8th to 10th. So you're welcome to stay if you wish, uh, or uh, take off for today. I'll have the order of adjournment for you in just a moment. That's eight. All right, uh, we are back as it relates to the adjudication trial that began earlier this morning for Mr. Deacons. May I have the names of our participants, please? Lee Heiss, lawyer, guardian, ad litem. Ms. Tasha Thomas, counsel for the department. Chelsea Craig, for the department. Mr. Brooks, can you hear us now? Well, we might have to take a little break to give a call over to his office and make sure he knows we're ready for him. Last call for Mr. Brooks. All right, we'll take a brief recess and uh, I'll ask my you can't, there You we can't hear me? Now I can. Yeah, I've been here for 30 minutes. <laughs> well, thank you for confirming. Mm -hmm. All right, we are ready to go back on uh, for your client's adjudication trial to finish it up. Uh, Ms. Uh, Thomas. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we had, when we had recess, I had asked uh, for the recess in the event um, Ms. Deacons would testify. At this point, I am not going to call Ms. Deacons and uh, in closing my portion of the arguments or presentation. All right. Uh, did you wish to uh, have any witness testimony, Mr. Brooks? No, we already did it. Any sense? I have no witnesses today. Thank you. 
All right, closing arguments then. Thank you, Your Honor. As this court is aware, um, the standard that the department uh, must meet is a preponderance of the evidence being more likely true than not, that at least one of the allegations in the petition are true and sufficient to um, find that there has been a violation of the juvenile code. Um, and as it relates to Mr. Deacons, we are specifically asking that the court find that he was able to provide care necessary for the children's health or moral well-being and had refused to do so, um, and that his home environment is an, unplace, is an unfit place for the children to live because of cruelty or depravity on part of the parent. In this case, you're not asked to look at the legality of the actions, but whether those action, actions pose a risk of harm to the children. As this court's aware, these proceedings are not meant to be punitive to parents, but to focus on the children's well-being. In Mr. Deacon's own testimony, there is a pattern of domestic violence, meaning violence amongst members of the home, not just intimate partner violence. And this remains unremedied, as it was the reason the children removed from his care dating back to 10 or 11 years ago. And despite completing the prior services to remedy those concerns, he has failed to demonstrate the long-term benefit from those services. His position is that it's not illegal to use corporal punishment. Um, this is despite the fact that he also admitted his anger is sometimes too much and gets in the way, that he has mental um, illnesses to the extent that it impairs his ability to maintain employment uh, and to respond appropriately at times, especially without medication, and that he struggles to manage his anger. And this is from someone who has access to resources, is engaged in those resources, but is struggling to demonstrate the benefit. Ms. Grant worked with this family for a month and a half before coming to the conclusion that the home was not safe for the children to remain in. Whether police are called arbitrarily or rightfully, this demonstrates the dysfunction in the home. Perhaps the children have not needed medical treatment for any physical ailments as a result of abuse, but their actions in seeking help speak for itself. Mr. Deacons may believe that the allegations of the petition are exaggerated, yet he admitted to a majority of them during his testimony, specifically hitting, slapping his children, having a quote unquote tough relationship with his wife and arguing in front of the children, not taking his mental health condition seriously enough to maintain medication, his reg medication regimen. And while none of these things are necessarily, while none of these things always necessitate for intervention, Ms. Grant testified to all the efforts put forth to help this family address those concerns. And simply put, they weren't enough. Mr. Deakins couldn't comply with court directives to not have contact with his wife or go to the family home. And at some point, we'd hope that either Mr. Deacons or Ms. Deacons um, <clears throat> would have the wherewithal to stop the cycle. Ms. Deacons has already taken a plea, and Mr. Deacons is equally part of the conditions that put these children at risk for more emotional and physical harm. And we believe, based on the testimony we've heard today, that our burden has been met, and we ask the court to take jurisdiction over Mr. Deacons. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brooks. Listening to counsel, I wonder or not whether or not we heard the same case or not. Now, I'm 76 years old. I was raised and educated under an entirely different set of cultural norms as regards corporal punishment than Ms. Grant, who was the DHHS witness. We're simply going to have to agree to disagree. But there's one thing she and I cannot disagree on. There is no medical evidence of physical abuse. There are no reports from the schools about physical abuse to the department. There are no police reports confirming physical abuse of these children. In short, all of the claims of physical abuse are unsubstantiated or rely upon the testimony of my client's wife. And the most I can say about her testimony is, is that it's suspect and that she calls the police. Apparently it's a coping mechanism she uses, call the cops. Uh, at the most, at, at the best, you could call her testimony suspect, and at worst, it's exaggerated. Mr. Deacons, contrary to what your wit the witness for DHHS said, is not in jail for d domestic violence. He is in jail for violation of his bond conditions to keep him out of his house, a house that his wife kept calling him up or contacting him in some way to come back home. In short, the standard of proof, which is preponderance of the evidence, has not been met here. They don't like my client's way of punishing his children, which is not injurious to them in any way. 
authorities have been brought in repeatedly and found nothing. And yet here he is having his kids taken away from him. I, I hope we don't have that kind of authority in the state government, because if we do, I definitely don't approve of it. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I hope that we're not perpetuating myths that domestic violence is only a physical act and that children who are in the presence of parents who are yelling and screaming are affected negatively. We know that the contemporary science with which the social worker has been trained more recent is it shows us that children's cortisol levels are increased and they sustain high levels of stress hormones. And this is actually when there is stress in the home, when there's yelling and screaming and people hitting each other, not that the children are being physically hit. This is domestic violence in the presence of the children. Um, we can measure the damage to developing brains so that we know that the children who are expo exposed to domestic violence uh, develop triggers and those triggers can not be commonly understood by caregivers, educators, and others in the community so that um, their be reaction, their behavior, their conditioning um, is treated as misbehavior. So we know that we have outcomes for these children who have had uh, an incarcerated parent, had a parent, parent with domestic violence, had a removal from the family. We know that their outcomes uh, are measurable, measurably less successful than their counterparts who don't have these risks. I would ask you to consider that uh, the domestic violence in the presence of the ch children. Now, these children are 14, 13, and 6. They are of sufficient age to articulate to us that they need help, and that's what they're articulating. They're articulating that the environment that the ch children live in is uh, an unfit place for them to develop appropriately. So I would ask you to consider that based on the testimony that we heard today, there is domestic violence that is uh, creating a risk to these children, uh, in both physical to them, but in addition to physical uh, abuse to them, and separate and distinct, the domestic violence in their presence, in their family is um, damaging to their development. And I'd ask you to find uh, for adjudication of this parent. Thank you. Thank you. The court finds all interested parties were given notice for purposes of today's adjudication trial. I did uh, have the benefit of uh, reviewing the petition uh, as uh, Ms. Thomas took the testimony of Mr. Aaron uh, Deakins. Um, and uh, I, there are any domestic violence uh, charges, according to his testimony. Um, and I do think that there is domestic, there's probable cause that there's domestic violence in this home, that it's happening around the children. The children made statements to that effect to uh, our investigating caseworker who testified to those, uh, and those were uncontested. There is uh, a history of involvement with CPS for the same reason uh, with services and Mr. Deacon's testimony that he completed those services, but uh, doesn't really know why he chose not to use those tools. Uh, further confirms that the dynamics that are currently in the home uh, continue to uh, reflect a, an environment of domestic violence, uh, which is a danger uh, to the mental health and the physical health of these children as they would be uh, witnesses to domestic violence between their parents. Uh, and I do think there's probable cause also to believe that uh, Mr. Deakins is um, using physical discipline in a way that uh, would constitute abuse. Um, or at least to the uh, frequency, to the extent that it uh, may not be leaving marks, but it's certainly leaving marks on the mental and emotional um, health of the children as they uh, reported. There's one of the children that was actively silent at one point, which is one of the risks that Ms. Uh, Heiss articulated. That is the effect that an environment like this has on the children. The domestic violence dynamics in the home uh, by Mr. Deacons against his wife uh, also is contributed to by uh, the uh, failure of Mr. Deakins to take care of his mental health. He has some pretty significant diagnoses that I understand uh, as including schizophrenia, um, ODD, and uh, was not taking his medications uh, from October forward, uh, which I'm sure, frankly, can contributed to uh, the decision making that uh, landed him in jail and charged with domestic violence at this time. 
he did share with us that at times he sees things that aren't there uh, and that his mental health does affect him and that now since he has been back on his medications that he's improving. So that is optimistic. Uh, he is currently in jail because he failed to follow court orders to abide by a no contact. Um, and so it is appropriate to continue the removal of the children from the home uh, where he has been shown to frequent despite court orders. Uh, I don't care, frankly, if it's because he thinks his wife called and wanted him back or not. There's a court order that prohibits him from being in the home. Uh, and furthermore, the court finds that he is a danger, a substantial risk of harm to the mental and emotional health of his children as a result of uh, the mental health concerns and the uh, domestic violence, and, which does constitute criminality. And for those reasons, uh, the children must remain in placement. Um, my extension that the initial findings as it relates to the mother also uh, remain in full force effect as it relates to the placement of these children pending further proceedings. But I do think that jurisdiction is appropriate uh, under the uh, section of the law that Ms. Thomas asked uh, the court to consider today, which is that uh, environment, uh, which is characterized by uh, domestic violence does uh, and criminality does contribute to a significant and substantial risk of harm and therefore uh, is a violation of the statute by the probable cause standard, and the court will take jurisdiction over Mr. Uh, Deakins for those reasons, uh, with the idea that uh, a case services plan will be put into place uh, to further aid him in looking for housing, stable housing and employment, which are also risks uh, that we don't wanna put the children at risk uh, of restoring children to him uh, with untreated mental health, pending domestic violence charges, um, patterns of domestic violence in the home, no, no home, stable home at this moment, and no employment in order to be able to make sure that he is there. Uh, at the current moment, uh, we find him uh, contributing from the Larry County Jail. So he uh, is not able to take place with the children at this time and is in need of case services in order to hopefully alleviate the risk of harm to uh, his children. And uh, the court looks forward to him making some progress on those points so that he can have some uh, visitation and uh, some time with his children safely. Our next stage of uh, things will be, of course, the uh, initial disposition in this file. We have uh, some time the week of the 12th for that. And I'd like to invite the attorneys to look at their uh, calendars. Let me know if they are available. 9.30, Tuesday, February 13th. I am here. Yes. Mr. Brooks? Fine, Your Honor. All right, thank you. So we'll see everyone then on February 13th at 9.30 for the initial disposition. And we'll trust uh, the department and the foster care caseworker to uh, reach out and work with Mr. Deakins as best uh, they can to look at the case services that best reflect the issues that were identified by the court today. And unless there's any questions, uh, that's all for today. Your Honor, thank you, Your Honor. This is just a matter of housekeeping. Sure. Um, in findings, the, um, Your Honor had indicated probable cause standard, and I just want to ensure that the findings also meet the preponderance. Standard. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, there is a preponderance of the evidence uh, standard here as well, uh, which is slightly higher, of course, than our probable cause standard, or than, I'm sorry, than the previously uh, indicated standard, uh, but I do find in the uh, court order will reflect that it has met that standard. Thank you, Your Honor. Anything else? We are back on record for the initial disposition uh, for uh, a parent that was adjourned uh, for several reasons last time. Appearances, please. Lee Heiss, lawyer guardian ad litem. Daja Thomas, counsel for the department. Ms. Madrid. Francesca Madrid, foster care worker for Fostering Solutions. Good morning. Ariel Berger here on behalf of Mother. Shall be. Yeah. Ms. Heiss. Thank you, Your Honor. I was able to visit with the children. They are um, in a placement that's very familiar to them and meeting all their needs, eagerly meeting all their needs. Um, the children are doing their best to uh, be attentive at school and uh, good attendance. And the family's very, the placement is very dedicated to getting the children where they're going. Um, I think there's going to be a change in the visits um, when I'm looking at um, benefit from services, it's, uh, it's difficult for me to um, assess when visits are not structured. I, and what I mean is in time, the start time, end time, and uh, whether there's supervision there or not supervision there. So I'm eager to, to see how those visits are going. I think the parental instability is improving and the children need to see that and it, have it demonstrated to them in a very structured way. Um, the, there is a group text 
that is working very well so that uh, the caregiver can rely on the parents for making decisions about the children. Um, and I would ask the court to order that that be the only contact outside of outside of the visit times. Um, I have given a list of items to the social worker and uh, we were gonna work on having the, uh, some of the children's possessions given to them at their placement so that they can um, be as comfortable as they can. Some of these things look like support animals and that kind of stuff. So um, I don't think there's any need for court involvement. I think that that can happen. Um, the agency has a good schedule moving forward for visits. Um, they were getting to be a little bit um, unsure when they start, unsure when they end. It was just the, the caregivers are very interested in the, the mother being there and seeing the children and um, our needs in the case. But she's willing to help us be a little bit more um, structured and the agency has a plan for that. So uh, the children's needs are being met in their current placement and they came in with some habits and um, maybe some unhealthy habits that I think will be changed over time. So I'm seeing a lot of electronics um, for Connor and I'm seeing some other things, but uh, they're being addressed. So I believe it's in their best interest to remain placed where they are pending reunification through services. Thank you. Ms. Thomas. Thank you. If Ms. Madrid can please be sworn in. All right, Ms. Thomas. Thank you. Ms. Madrid, you had provided the court with a court report and proposed case service plan back in January, um, that was several weeks ago. Are there any updates or modifications that need to be made to your court report or to the case service plan? Um, <clears throat> yes, um, Ms. Deacons did complete three online parenting classes since um, writing the report. Um, and we also have her psychological evaluation scheduled. <clears throat> and at this time, do you believe that there would still be a substantial risk of harm if the children were to be returned to Ms. Deacons at this time? Yes. And can you just briefly elaborate what that risk of harm would be? Yes, the kids could be exposed to business improper um, discipline and domestic violence. The, um, and what is the permanency goal for the children at this time? Reunification. And what would be the barriers to reunification or what are the barriers to reunification? Um, at this time, we are working towards um, securing the psychological eval evaluation recommendations, trauma assessments for the children. Um, Ms. Deacons is engaged in individual therapy, um, so making progress towards her domestic violence concerns, um, as well as parenting time. Um, prior to today, have you been able to start any services with mom to address those barriers? Yes, we have the psychological schedule. Um, she did complete um, three, again, MSU extension parenting classes. Um, and then she did just began a trauma-informed parenting um, course that takes eight weeks. Um, and again, she has um, individual counseling through family medical. Wonderful. I'm sorry, family counseling services. Great. And the children are placed in a relative placement, correct? And they're all placed together? Yes. Um, Ms. Heiss in her report had indicated some changes or uh, something with parenting time that needs to be addressed. Um, in your opinion, how has parenting time been going? I, well, let's start with what is the current plan for parenting time or what has been the plan? How has that been going? And what is the plan yes. moving forward? Yes, so parenting time has been going well. Um, in the beginning of the case, there was um, not a lot of structured parenting time. It was kind of, there was confusion of how long mom could stay um, due to the court order saying liberal parenting time. Um, so we did decide to put some structure into it where um, mom visits four times a week, Mondays, um, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Um, Mondays will be supervised by us and Thursdays will be supervised by us. And then um, Wednesdays and Saturdays will be supervised by the caregiver. About how many hours a week does that give mom with the children? She visits about eight to 12 hours. Wonderful. Um, and during parenting time, let's meet all of their needs and provide for them in whatever capacity that it might be during those parenting times. 
Yes, as of right now, um, we don't have any significant concerns. Um, we're definitely, we just started supervising most of those parenting times. Um, but she does coordinate with the caregiver for dinners and things like that. Wonderful. As it relates to the case service plan, did you have an opportunity to develop that um, in collaboration with mom? Yes, I did. Okay. And do you believe that it sufficiently addresses the conditions that cause the children to come into care? Yes. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to let the court know about the children's well-being or how they're doing at this time? Um, all of their needs are being met. Um, I'm in the process of submitting trauma assessments for them. Um, they, I know that Connor has an uh, individual therapist through CMH, um, so they're working on independence. He has had some accidents, bathroom accidents, um, so that is something that we're addressing as well as some other concerns um, with schooling and the older girls. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, I have no further questions of Ms. Madrid and would move to admit to the court report with uh, the proposed case service plan. I have a uh, February 7th court report as well. I think that's for dad's review. Is that for dad's? I think, because I have that too. And it's all about Mr. Deacons and his case service plan. All right. Okay, well, the January 17th one uh, with the proposed case services plan is in front of me. Any objection to the admission of that, Ms. Berger? No objection. No objection. Thank you. It is received. Questions for this witness, Ms. Berger? Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Madrid, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, are there any uh, referrals or recommendations that have not been sent out yet? Um. I don't believe so. I know that I have not been able to make contact with our therapist yet, but that's something that I'll be able to verify during the next report period. Okay. Do you have a release of information? I do believe she signed one. Um, I just haven't made direct contact with her yet. Okay. And were you able to um, read through the case service plan with her once it was completed? I read through every um, domain of the case service plan with her, yes. Okay. And has she signed that case service plan yet? She has not, no. I do have a copy of today. She can sign. Okay. What things should she be focusing her energy on right now? Um, right now, she should be focusing on um, attending parenting time consistently and maintaining appropriate interactions with the kiddos, um, continuing her individual counseling, focusing on domestic violence, um, she will be participating in the psychological evaluation following all, all recommendations from that, um, maintaining her employment, um, securing safe and stable housing. Those are the main things. And when is that psych eval scheduled? Um, I'm sorry, I would have to look and check for the date. I don't have it off the top of my head. Okay, that's okay. Um, as far as housing goes, is there any way that she can make her current housing safe and appropriate? Are there any recommendations from the agency regarding that? Is that in regards to the address? Um, the, the, the marital home. I'm not sure if that's where it is or not. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I'm not sure where what where the home is located, the home that she shared with her um, husband. Okay, well, she indicated to me that she was not going to be living there anymore. Um, when I first made contact and received the case, she was living there. Um, there was an incident um, where she did have law enforcement contact the home. Um, it didn't have anything to do with her, but um, the police did make contact with her due to some concerns in the area. Um, after that, she reported to me that she is planning to move in with her father-in-law and um, <clears throat> secure placement with him as far as living with him. Okay, and do you know if that's happened yet? I do not know if that's happened yet. Okay. Okay, no further questions. Thank you. Ms. Heiss. The children have requested some of their personal items and you're aware of the list. Is that right? Yes. And you'll help work on which of those items they can have sooner or later? Yes, I'll work with mom. And then if the mother does give up tenancy of the home, will you make sure uh, that we have a chance to recover more even of the children's possessions? Yes. And then um, yes. Um, that group text, who all is on that group text? 
Um, she has a group pet with the caregiver, um, Crystal. Okay. And then um, do you agree that contact outside of that should be limited to visits? It's, not my, it's my understanding that she doesn't have any contact outside of the group chat and parenting chat. And you would find that appropriate? Yes. Um, do you think that uh, at some point, if the children want to, like one of these visits could be just with Connor because he's really missing mom, and then maybe another visit could just be with the older girls so they can have kind of grown up time with mom and Connor would stay home. Is that possible? That's definitely something we can explore, yes. Um, are we getting notes from the caregivers regarding the supervised visits or are they just going to let you know if anything goes well, super great or super bad? Um, we actually are, I'm going to be implementing starting today, um, a written note that they will have to provide to me once they supervise. Okay. Um, this 915 PM stop time for visits. Is that something that the caregivers have been included in scheduling that? Um, they indicated to me, they would like to have the visits end no later than 9 PM. Um, so that is what's going to be agreed upon. Okay. And then, so maybe start at 15 minutes early so that mom still gets the same amount of time. We're not trying to do that. We're just trying to keep the kids schedule for bed and school. Yes. Yeah, so with mom's work, I believe that's like the earliest she can get there, but okay. we'll keep it open if she's able to get there earlier. Okay. Sure. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, that, that concludes my questions. Thank you. Uh, do you know what the trauma screening scores were for the children? I do not know what the Would you be able to provide a copy of those screenings yes. at our next review? Uh, and then it looks like that the adjudication for mom, uh, <clears throat> and this was not echoed in the adjudication for dad, but I think it probably should have been. That I had asked you to look into the counselor for recommendations on parenting time. Were you able to find a counselor that would be able to help understand the best structure, frequency, duration of parenting time for both parents, really? Um, that is not something I've secured yet. All right. Would you be able to look into that in our next time frame? Yes, I will. Okay. Specifically for mom? For both, really. Okay. Especially, uh, you know, yep. with all the issues that were explored during dad's adjudication. And then, uh, did you say that you had some indication that she has begun, did you say parent education? Yes, she's doing a trauma informed course, um, and then she also completed three online um, parenting classes. What what classes are they? The names of them I don't have off the top of my head, but they are online MSU extension classes. Will you be looking at any um, parenting education for her in a community grabber like orchards or something yes. or anything? Okay. Um, and then finally, I know one of the main concerns. Um, here was uh, the environment in the home and making sure that Ms. Deakins is able to, um, even if she separates from Mr. Deakins, ensure that we don't have that situation reoccurring with her next partner. Is there any targeted uh, focus on that with her therapist? Yeah, I believe that's what we'll be addressing during her individual counseling. Who is her individual counselor? Her name is Jackie through Family Counseling in Adrian, um, but I have not been able to make direct contact with her yet. All right, when you do that, um, if you would, I ask her if she would like to see, you know, the petition itself. And then, of course, once you get the psychological evaluation, make sure that she has the false materials as well. And you may want to check in with her. And it's, I'm telling you to check in with her with regard to progress in the other areas that she's making so that her counselor can help support um, her efforts and services. I think the more we can keep our counselors in the loop, the better off our parents are going to be. Yes, well. Thank you. All right, questions based on my questions, Ms. Thomas? Or anything else? No. Ms. Berger? No, Your Honor, thank you. Ms. Hux? No, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. May I return your seat? Anyone else you'd like us to hear from, Ms. Thomas? No, Judge, thank you. Ms. Berger? Chanel, would you like to testify today? No. Okay. No, then, Your Honor, thank you. All right, Ms. Heiss, anybody you want to see here from today? No witnesses, thank you. All right, comments then? Thank you, Judge. I believe that Ms. Madrid has heard your concerns and directives. Um, at this time, we're just asking the court to enter the case service plan and schedule this for a standard review. Thank you. Ms. Berger. I am in agreement with that, Your Honor. 
It's nice. Um, we have another date to add on uh, father's services and visits and those kinds of things. Um, I hope we'll set the next review at the same time because we just uh, set up a pretty big visit schedule for the children with mom. And now I've got dad out of jail that, and, and we have to accommodate his time too. So it'll probably go swimmingly, but I just ask that the next review be scheduled together if possible. Very good. We do have father's initial disposition coming up on February 13th. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, our next review for both parents, I'd like to suggest if Ms. Berger's available Tuesday, April 23rd, and I'll go ahead and schedule that from 10 to noon so that we could do uh, their hearings separately, but also back to back and address all the issues at the same time. And if the attorneys want to stay or if you want to stay, you're welcome to stay, but that also allows for the separation of the parties. I understand that there's a lot going on there right now with the criminal proceedings as well as that sounds like divorce custody. So, well, work them separately, but together as best we can in order to keep everyone involved and in the loop. Ms. Berger, are you available? I am, yes. Sure. Anyone else have any conflicts while we're talking about it? No. No, Judge, thank you. All right, so we'll have our next, uh, well, first regular review on Tuesday, April 23rd at 10 o'clock. Uh, and we'll begin with Ms. Deakins, and then we'll have Mr. Uh, Deakins to follow, and I'll reannounce that at his initial disposition on February 13th. With regard to father's parenting time, I would like to have that uh, as recommended by a counselor. I think that you will, well, you'll probably have to look at whatever's happening with this criminal case as well, because uh, with the children being potentially witnesses, I, I'm not sure if there would be bond conditions that would, be, that would need to be taken into consideration as it relates to his criminal proceedings. So please uh, be cognizant of that. Um, all three children are being referred for trauma assessments, which means that uh, the numbers on the trauma screens were high, I'm sure. So uh, before you do any parenting time with dad, now that he's released from jail, I'd like to have a counselor weigh in on that to make sure that we're not destabilizing any progress that they've been able to make uh, or destabilizing them further. This case is still pretty, pretty new as far as removal only being January 12, 2024. It's only been a month ago, and I already mentioned a few issues that we're having with Connor, uh, as well as uh, with the other two children, and I, I don't want to make it any more challenging for them than it already has been. Ms. Deakins. Uh, Connor's been having these accidents for months. He's been having these accidents. Um, and the kids saw Aaron on Monday, and there was an incident at visit where the kids explode my older two exploded on me all right well we're going to be back talking about his training time and his um case services on the 13th so if you would like to join us to even if it's by zoom in order to uh, offer any other testimony or observations about that uh, you know we welcome you to, to join us uh, Ms. Berger if she's available would also be welcome to join us uh, to for further engage that conversation but Ms. Francesca Madrid your first order of business, please, is to find us a counselor to talk to the kids and make us a recommendation as fully informed as possible. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, all parties are given notice for purposes of today's disposition as it relates to Ms. Channel Deacons. Uh, I have reviewed the uh, case services plan that's been proposed. I do find also that it targets the areas that we want to make sure Ms. Deacons is making progress in. Uh, Deputy Anders, would you take this over to her so she can have one more look at it? Uh, Ms. Deacons, if this is the plan, as you recall it, uh, and you feel comfortable signing it, please uh, feel free to do that so we know that you're on board with this plan as well. It does appear to target those areas. Ms. Madrid is in compliance with her obligations as well as Ms. Heiss. Thank you, ladies. Uh, and thank you to our advocates as well. Uh, the children are in the safest and least restrictive environment right now. It's with a relative. Ms. Deakins at least is enjoying the additional benefits that come along with that, which is great to see and hear. We're at the beginning, the outset of the case, so many of those issues that were identified in the initial adjudication continue to be outstanding, and we Deacons to continue working on some of those before we can allow the children to be returned to her care. There are also some additional things in flux. Uh, we discussed a bit today, uh, such as the release of Mr. Deacons from incarceration, uh, some issues with the time, and of course those dynamics, thank you, in the household continue to be uh, a risk of harm uh, to the children. So. For those reasons, they will remain where they are pending our next review hearing, which again will be April 23rd at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, records should reflect I have received the case services plan back from the deacons. 
Uh, you'll have a copy of this in just a few minutes after the order's done. I'll take with you, but she just signed this one. Unless there's any questions, that's all for today. Reg, I do have a, a question just to clarify. Um, as it relates to dad's parenting time, are, are you asking us not to allow that until we have something from the therapist? That seems to be what looks appropriate to me at this point, but um, Ms. Heist, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Your Honor, I'm sorry, I was uh, responding to something else. Would you remind me? That's okay. So Ms. Thomas is uh, asking me, frankly, if I would like the department to withhold parenting time from uh, Mr. Deacons until our next, at least until our next year. Yes, until the next hearing, that would be appropriate. But uh, that Connor really is, um, might not want it to last much longer. But yes, to the next hearing, I agree. All right, uh, that's just next week. Uh, I'd love for Ms. Madrid to find us a counselor, at least to get on the calendar for an appointment on that. Uh, and we'll look at that more intensely next week. Uh, but given what we heard from Ms. Deacons today and my concerns uh, that were outlined at the adjudication, I don't know what his uh, state of mind is right now. We're going to look at that next week. But based on the allegations in the petition, the few bits of information I've had today, uh, and historically, frankly, he's been incarcerated, hasn't really had access to the children. Uh, I think it would be appropriate uh, to ask the department to withhold here any time until after next week's hearing where we can look at it more in depth with him here. Any other questions? No, Your Honor. Okay. See you next week. I'll have the order for you in just a few minutes.